This is a famous writer. This is his monument. And this is a slightly middle-aged guy trying to get into his kilt. It's definitely not a skirt. It's tartan for a start, like the shirts of lumberjacks. And lumberjacks are hard. But what's the deal? Why do Scotsmen feel the need to wear skirts, kilts, at weddings, and for every other given excuse? Why was it illegal? What do we wear underneath? And is it true they were invented by an Englishman? <gasps> Welcome to Scotland Unplugged and the story of the kilt. These are very kilted 19th century clan chiefs. You can see the illustrious history. Great men wearing the dress of their ancestors that harks back centuries. Well, not exactly. There was a bit of fashion involved. If you watch Braveheart, you'll see that everyone on the Scottish side, apart from some of the dastardly nobles, are wearing kilts. The truth is that Braveheart is a fantastically entertaining work of fiction. And one of the major bits of fiction is how they looked. William Wallace was the son of a knight from the lowlands and kilts were worn by manual workers from the highlands, probably a good 300 years later. This is the Philibeg. The mini kilt. The original kilt was the Philimore, or the Great Kilt, or sometimes the Belted Plaid. As the name suggests, it's pretty big. You can wrap it round you like a blanket and secure it with a belt. It can be worn over the shoulder or as a hood or slept in. But why? What's wrong with trousers? Kilts first came into use amongst the Gaelic speakers of the Highlands and Islands. In these kinds of environments, trousers wouldn't have been the most practical things. They would have been pretty much useless until wellies were invented. It was much more useful to have something that stopped at the knee, meaning you could get your feet as wet as you wanted. Before that, people would have worn robes. So you can see how it was a sort of a natural progression. If you want to learn more about the Philomore, I'll put a link in the description to Andy the Highlander putting one on. And though it might make me feel like Mary Quant, the Philabeg is still a bit of a faff. Check out the bonus video to see how it's done. So if the kilt was worn by a pretty select subgroup of people, how on earth did it become national dress? I mean, if you go back to the painting at the beginning, it's like a couple of oligarchs rocking up to a photo shoot in overalls. I wouldn't rule it out given enough time. But this all has to do with romanticism, vanity, and the man who reshaped how we and the world see Scotland. This is Sir Walter Scott, and this is his monument in the middle of Edinburgh. It's quite something. The kind of thing Victor Frankenstein might take to the moon. But you have to shift yourself some paperbacks to get one of these. Walter Scott pretty much reimagined how we see Scotland today in his writing. Then he turbocharged it by reimagining how the king saw Scotland. Walter had polio as a child, so he was sent to live with his grandparents on their farm in the borders. There he heard and grew to love the ballads and folk tales of the area. As an adult, he began to collect and rewrite a lot of these tales. Rob Roy McGregor, William Wallace and Robin Hood are all figures he repackaged. This is George IV Bridge, named after the man himself. George IV came to the throne in 1820, following the death of his father, George III, the Mad One. Prior to that, he'd been Prince Regent, looking after things on his father's behalf. George 4.0 wasn't exactly what you'd call popular. He liked his food, he liked his drink, 
he especially liked his women. Here he is on a roundabout on his very own street. He was deeply unpopular in London, partly due to the way he treated his wife, but he was a big fan of the work of our Walter. So George invited Walter for dinner, and Walter persuaded him that as King of Great Britain and King of Scotland, really he should visit. The last visit by a reigning monarch had been 170 years before, when Charles II visited briefly to get crowned. That's a bit of a gap. George was a Hanoverian king. Prior to their dynasty taking the throne, the Stuarts had reigned for 300 odd years. Then they'd tried to take it back a few times, most famously when Bonnie Prince Charlie had started his uprising in 1745. Following his defeat at the Battle of Culloden in 1746, the Highland identity was a problem. The Hanover side wanted to suppress it as much as possible. The following year, the Act of Prescription was passed. The wearing of kilts and tartan was banned in most Highland counties, unless you were a clan chief, female or in the British Army. And the punishment was severe. Six months in the big house for the first offence, and seven years transportation if you were mental slash patriotic enough to do it again. 35 years later, when it was finally allowed again, most people had lost interest. But Romantics wore it in protest. Now the Jacobites were no longer a threat, they were the underdogs. People started to identify with them. Then as time moved on and Walter heard the tales and romanticised them even more and became a publishing phenomenon in his own right, kilts took on a whole new identity. Clan chiefs met in gentlemen's clubs where the rules stated firmly that they had to wear the garb of old Gaul. It was all a bit Walt Disney, but it served a purpose, an identity, a romantic ideal of the Highlands as this mythical, magical place. I mean, it is a mythical, magical place. But Lowlanders weren't convinced. They saw the Highlands as wild and a little bit barbarous. Well, a lot of them would. They'd been at war only a short time ago. But they'd never worn kilts or anything like that. So why should they start now? During his dinner, Walter flattered the Prince Regent, appealed to his ego, poured honey in his ear. He was, the writer said, as much of a Stuart as Bonnie Prince Charlie was. I mean, he could trace his ancestors back along the same line. European royals aren't known for their genetic diversity. George took the bait and agreed to a visit. But only after his father had died and he'd been crowned. So on the 14th of August, 1822, the year he turned 60, he sailed north. He arrived by sea at Leith and stayed in Dalkeith Castle. During his visit, he wore a kilt, one that he'd had commissioned from George Hunter and Co. for the sum equivalent to £130,000 in today's money. Slightly eye-watering and controversial. He had bloated legs and so to hide them, he wore flesh-coloured stockings. And his kilt was a bit too short. He was parodied and cartooned ruthlessly. When someone said it was a bit immodest, a Lady Hamilton Dalrymple supposedly said, since he's to be among us for so short a time, the more we see of him the better. None of it mattered. The crowds were massive. Walter Scott distributed leaflets telling everyone how to dress for the occasion, entitled, Hints addressed to the inhabitants of Edinburgh and others in prospects of his majesty's visit by an old citizen. Fear of missing out left some high up lowlanders scrambling around looking for a highland ancestor or two who might give them the right to wear the kilt. It stuck. Like all things, names, customs, fashions, when people with influence start doing it, whether we like it or not, it soon filters down to the rest of us. Queen Victoria took on the tradition, dressing her own sons in kilts, etc. Tourism boomed. But what about the mini kilt? Well, that could have been an invention of practicality. One story goes that a Thomas Rawlinson of Lancashire designed it along with an army tailor in Inverness. 
after the 1715 Jacobite Rebellion, the government opened up the Highlands to exploitation. Rawlinson supposedly had charcoal production interests in the Highlands and wanted something his workers could wear that didn't get in the way. If you think about it, the Philomore's practical for running around hills and sleeping rough, but not so much for hard manual labour in the heat. Then the army adopted it for similar reasons. During the First World War, the Black Watch wore it as part of their uniforms and were so feared they were nicknamed the Ladies from Hell. The Rawlinson story is based on a letter published in the Edinburgh Magazine in 1785. And some say that it was sent to discredit the wearing of traditional Highland dress by the regiments. Possibly someone wanted it stopped. Maybe they didn't have the legs for it. There has been quite a bit of debate about it down the years though. We don't know who invented the mini kilt, but so many of our traditions come from outside Scotland. Bagpipes weren't invented here, but we're still stuck with them. Yes, the kilt was pile and dress before for about 200 years, but it's been national dress for 200 years since. I mean, before Walter came along, tartans weren't even based on your family name but on where you came from. Tradition says that you should wear your mother's tartan or your father's tartan. There are all sorts of rules. But who cares? Traditionally, it's workwear. So if you want to be really pedantic about it, maybe you should be accessorising it with a pair of goggles and some ear defenders. Possibly an axe. Possibly not in public. Traditions change, evolve, move on. And that's a good thing. But what do you wear under your kilt? Well, that's entirely up to you.